to take it to how you engage customers in the world that we now live in, and that's a big deal. I went, when I got into the world of tech, I got into first uh, Lotus Notes, then ERP, then I found CRM, kind of made my career in that, and I wanted it to be something really big. It was, but not the way I wanted it. And I was trying to figure out why it didn't become that, and I realized the world had changed dramatically. Now, a lot of you probably think when I say that, that yeah, you know, 15 some odd years ago, we had a business revolution. And if you actually think that, you'd be dead wrong. That's not what we had. We actually had a communications revolution, right? And that means with whom we communicate, how we communicate, what we expect of them we communication, how frequently we communicate, and how quickly we want a response transform. And how we create, how we distribute, and how we consume information transform. And you can say, yeah, business, right? No, every institution on this planet was changed by that. And in addition to that, almost every one of us as individuals was changed by that. So that what we had was a digital communications revolution that transformed the world and how we live in it. And then the question became, OK, well, we're in business. Some of us are small. Some of us are mid-size. Maybe there's a few enterprises represented here. How did that impact how our customers are thinking about us? Or how did it impact us as customers ourselves? And the first one was what I said, how we communicated it changed. But then we also had to think about what our expectations became. Because it was no longer just products and services. It was products, services, experiences, and also, by the way, the tools that we were provided to, con to handle our own interactions with those businesses. That made a major difference. We were no longer just expecting good products, good services. We had to have all of them or it wasn't enough. So what happened for that? Well, then it got the attention of executives in boardrooms all across the world. And it became a matter of real concern to them. If our customers' expectations are changing, then how do we deal with it? Because it's not something that was immediately obvious to anybody when if, other than lip service. You know, yeah, our customers are changing. We've got to do something, and we are. But when somebody said, what are you doing? They said, well, scratching our head, actually, at the moment. But we'll figure it out. So what did they do? They started to figure it out. But before they figured it out, we started hearing all the typical stuff that happens when you're starting to talk about something a little bit different, a little bit new, and then there was all kinds of confusion over definitions in the market and how things were going. Because you know, at that point, we already had this. And this had been around for a long time. Right? It had been around for probably 10, 15 years. We were hearing about customer experience all the time. We were hearing about customer engagement. And especially the top two were being used interchangeably. And yet they're not the same. And it actually will make a difference to how you function if you don't actually understand that difference. Now, when I entered the world of CRM, this is what I wanted it to be. A science of business that attempts to reproduce an art of life, which is how human beings interact. And that's a rather lofty idea. I wanted it to be a philosophy. I wanted it to be very strategic in everything. I wanted it to be the way that you did things, lived your life, etc. It's not what it turned out to be. This is what it turned out to be. I'll let you read it. It's a long definition. It's a little kludgy. But basically, CRM becomes the technology and the systems you use to enable your business operations around customer-facing activities. And if I say to you, tell me about CRM, what you would tell me that, I presume, for the most part. Right? Something related to that. You say, I use Zoho One. I use Zoho CRM. Right? You wouldn't say, yeah, it's our philosophical outlook. Right? It's our strategic foundation. You'd say, it's what we use. And that's OK. I mean, I fought the fight till about, I want to say, 2014. And then I finally gave up on the battle because I wasn't winning. In fact, well, I, no, let me put it another way. I lost. Right? So uh, this is what it became. But 
We then had to deal with other definitions and other things because, you know, if you don't clarify what you're thinking and doing, then your customers are never going to understand what you're thinking and doing. And so we began looking at customer experience. Now, one of the leading um, thinkers on customer experience was Bruce Temkin, who ran, was a Forrester analyst, became, uh, ran his own group called the Temkin Group until they were acquired by Qualtrics, which was then acquired by SAP. And this was his definition of customer experience the perception that customers have of their interactions with an organization. Fair enough, because it's the bigger idea. This is my definition, you know, which is the one I kind of stick with. How a customer feels about a company over time, right? And the reality of this one is, no matter what you think, and no matter how many companies claim this, you can't enable that with technology. It's impossible, it's a feeling, it's emotions, right? You cannot enable them with technology. How a customer feels about a company over time involves all the interactions they have, what the last interaction was, what the very first impression they had of your company, and then it also involves at a different level what Ray was talking about, a whole other idea of the customer experience which is around consumable experiences. What he was describing about Disney being a perfect example of that. But there's one reality that kind of drives all of this stuff. And it's a very simple reality, which is this. If a customer likes you and continues to like you, they'll continue to do business with you. If they don't, they won't. And it's not as complex as that is because every customer's idea of what it takes to like you is different. It's as simple as that. I mean, how many companies that you got disgusted with did you continue to do business with unless you absolutely had no other option whatsoever? I can speak for Comcast on that one for a long time. I hated their guts, yet stuck with them for 16 years. It was sheer inertia, right? I mean, I had no, I, I, you, know what, you know what stopped me honestly from changing from Comcast and how simple it was? I thought about what it would take to change my email. And I realized, oh my God, I was like 10,000 emails that are tied to Comcast.net. And I have to change all of those user IDs and everything. And I didn't move until Comcast did something which I won't get into now, although happy to tell the story some other time, uh, that was so egregiously stupid, I finally made the change. 16 years. But that's what I'm talking about. There's no other option there. But other than that, you switch when you don't like that, uh, that business because the way they treat you. This is Bruce Tampkin's kind of breakdown, and there's something really important in what we're going to talk about today with engagement that applies here. These three components. How does it make people feel? Does it do what people want it to do, which is one of the most important things you could possibly think of, and we'll get to why in a minute, and how, and this tied to that, how easy is it to do it? And I cannot tell you how important that one is. And we're going to talk about it in a minute. Now, then the question goes, since it happens to be the core of what we're going to talk about, is what's customer engagement? OK, what, what the hell is that? Because that's not what I just described. Well, these are things it isn't, right? It's not marriage, meaning you don't have the same, you know how you always hear, oh, well, we, I love this company. You don't love that company the way you love your spouse, OK? It's a different kind of love. Or I, I just. Companies want you to love them that way, but it's not it. But it's also not advocacy or loyalty. It engenders it, creates it, but it isn't it, right? And one thing it's really not, and this is the most important part, it's not consistently the same level. I'll give you an example of what I mean. Because, you know, there tends to be this view that successful customer engagement is driven by passionate interactions on a continuous basis. And that's just not the case. I'll give you a, a story. I'll tell you a story. Many years ago, for the first time, this is like 12, 13 years ago. I guess, well, actually, it's probably 11 years ago. I bought a refrigerator that had a water filter in it. And it came with one, you know. And, uh, but I had to figure out, well, when I have to replace it, where the hell am I going to get water filters? So I went online. I was looking around. I found this company called FridgeFilters.com. Does anybody here use them? No? OK, use them. Oh, one, one in the back, one very smart person. Um, so fridgefilters.com sells every imaginable type of water filter, without exception. Uh, and, and we've even swapped refrigerators since then and get it from them again. 
And here's what happened. I go online, I buy two. And then it says, do you want to set up a notification or a reminder that will send you every six months to, or whatever month you choose, about buying it? So I said, yeah. So every six months for the last 11 years, I've been getting one reminder from them saying, time to buy water filters. Click here. I click there. Click here. I buy it. And then the only other thing I hear from them is, it's shipped. And I love them. I, it's like I have no interactions almost. And I love them. You know why? Because they do exactly what I want them to do. Nothing more, nothing less. I don't need to be delighted by them. What are they going to give me? Water? I, I just, I, I love the fact that I get reminded, oh, right. And then I click, click, and I'm done. And life goes on, and we're all happy. And I've talked about fridgefields.com to probably, I don't know, half a million people. So they're getting, hopefully, some customers out of this. But that's what I'm saying. The same level, never the case. It has nothing to do with how passionate you are about the company. So what is customer engagement? At least my definition is the, kind of the foundation for the book that I've just written. It's that one on the top there. It's the ongoing interactions between company and customer offered by the company, chosen by the customer. And I will tell you, that is a loaded statement. Really loaded. The obvious and easy part is the word ongoing, right? Obviously, you don't have customer engagement if the engagement ends at one interaction. So not ongoing, that's easy. The other two, offered by the company, chosen by the customer, you really have to put your head around. So here's the deal. When you're a company, and you know whether you're tiny or gigantic, it doesn't really matter. The day you're born as a company, you're born with constraints. Regulatory constraints, financial constraints, labor constraints, time constraints, and you can keep going. But you're constrained immediately. Your resources are fully constrained. Yet, the customers you have don't really give a crap about how constrained you are. They don't care. Why would they, actually? Um, they want something from you, and they want it the way they want it, and they want you to provide it to them. All right. Now, here's the thing. On the other hand, they also don't care about all the things your other customers want. So what makes it tricky for you is, as you grow past the number of easily manageable known customers, you start going to a point where, well, this customer wants this, and this customer wants this, and this one, and this one, and this one. I don't even know what they want, and so on and so forth. And yet, you're still constrained. That hasn't changed. You only have so many resources you can devote. So you have to start figuring out, and that's what we'll be getting into as we go through this, how you actually deal with that situation and still make the customer feel as if they're important to you. That's what it means by offered by the company. Chosen by the customer goes to the heart of life itself. Um, think about this. There's seven and a half billion people on the planet. And there's only one thing we all have in common. Literally one. We all want to be happy. And that's it. That one thing. And on our journey toward happiness, we all want to be happy. Right? We don't want to be miserable on our way to happiness unless we're like deeply into S&M or something. Right, so, right, so on your journey to happiness, the way you're happiest is when you get to choose as much of that path as you can without imposing it on other people. You're at your happiest when you make your own choices. If a business is functioning correctly, it's allowing the customer choices within its constraints because it does have to mind its own constraints as a business, but as a customer, you want to have choices or make you think the business perceives you as important to them. And again, we're going through detail. We'll get to the details as we do this. One of the choices that we can easily talk about is one that we now call omni-channel, right? But, you know, if you look back in history a little bit, um, we all communicated, well, or there was a strategy actually called multi-channel. What that meant was, look, there's a there's dozens of channels out there. We have to find the channel that our customers can particularly choose to communicate on and optimize for that channel. That didn't work because it's not how we communicate. Here's how we communicate. I'm going to tell you a story. 
without the slide, but I'm going to tell you a story of my, my niece. When she was 18, my wife and I decided to buy her a laptop so to go to college. So uh, one day, I get a tweet from her saying, uh, uh, Uncle Paul, can I get your cell phone number? Hashtag love my uncle, hashtag miss you guys. This is when we only had 140 character tweets, so that was 120 of them, I think. So she would send me that note, and I DM'd her in response to my cell phone. Didn't hear from her for a couple of days. So then I get a Facebook message, or I send her a Facebook message that says, hey, did you get my DM with my cell phone? And she sends a note back and says, yeah, I did. I'll text you mine. Now, I want you to think of what happened there. DM, Twitter, cell phone, text, Facebook, all in literally two, two interactions. And so she texts me her cell phone number, and the next communication we have is a text chat back and forth on when we're going to talk on Skype. And then we talked on Skype. And then, when we're done talking on Skype, we figured out the laptop, and we went to the store in person and bought the laptop. Now, that occurred in roughly 32 hours. And that's six channels in 32 hours. Now, you could say, well, you know, she's a digital native. That's how she communicates. Folks, listen, I'm on Medicare, and that's how I communicate. So this has nothing to do with age whatsoever. This has to do with how we all communicate. And you know how we communicate? We don't communicate omni-channel. We communicate channellessly. We don't think about the channels we're communicating on. We just communicate and we think about how we're interacting or what we're saying. And it just happens to be however it is. The problem a business has, of course, is they have to think omni-channel because they have to determine the channels that those customers are going to communicate on. Years ago, Aberdeen Group, which is a company I don't love, to be honest, uh, did some research on omni-channel communication. They found out the best-in-class communicators have seven channels they're prepared to use when it comes to their customers. And they had some outliers that had like 23 channels. But that's the key. What are you doing with the customer by doing that? You're giving them the choice of how they want to communicate. And the key is the choice, even more so than the channel. So hold that thought. Now, this is just more the history of how engagement has started to go mainstream. And I'm going to point out a couple of points along the history. You remember what Ray was saying about that efforts around digital transformation? Back in 2014, McKinsey did a study in July. And it said when somebody was undergoing a digital transformation effort, what was the primary reason they were doing it? 69% of the respondents said to improve customer engagement. And that, again, we're talking about mainstream customer engagement and thinking going on as something that becomes more and more important. By 2018, 67% of all respondent companies in another study said we are now ma mapping and tracking our customer journeys. And now, another study being done just this year on retailers, 79% of retailers said that engaging personalized interactions and messages are key to customers becoming or remaining loyal. Meaning, customer engagement is at the core of the thinking in all areas of business and in, in verticals across the world. So how do you start preparing to do this, big or small business? These are some of the concerns you're going to have. This, on these slides, which will be available to you through Zoho if you want them, the big one, really, when it boils down, is the experience and expectations, those two. Here's the deal. When the customer is communicating with you, they, will, they expect in every channel that you communicate with them that they're going to have the best possible result of the best channel. What that means, very simple. We'll go back to that Comcast example. Um, years and years ago, uh, Comcast created a tweetable customer service channel, very first ever. And that customer service channel was one person at the time. Now it's about 30 or 40. Um, and they would respond within two hours of the tweet. The problem is, word got out about it worldwide. And consequently, when somebody would take a day or two to respond on email or a phone call, they'd have to wait six hours to get a return call. That wasn't good enough anymore. The expectation had changed dramatically. 
It was expected that you will equal what happened on Twitter. So the expectation became the best possible time of interaction, and Comcast was even hurt more by the fact that they couldn't meet that demand in any other channel. So you have to make sure that you're always managing those expectations. The other one is you see making the experience seamless regardless of channel. I want you to think about just the word seamless, and I'm going to hold, hold the phone now. So what do you have to do then if these are the things you have to concern yourself with? Well, when it boils down to it, you have to meet those customers' expectations. OK, that's first and foremost of everything. And there's a meaning to that. First, they're going to need this, that you have to provide them with the products and services that you provide, whatever they are. You have to provide them with the experiences that Ray was talking about, meaning things that lead to the outcomes they're looking for that are not necessarily uh, products or specific services, but are more total than that, and the tools they need to make it easy. I'll give you an example. We'll go back to Disney. Many years ago, Disney uh, Destinations, which is their travel arm, had real problems with their, uh, their profitability. They began sinking. And they did, you know, Disney, as most of you know it well, it's a very data-driven organization. They did their research, and they found that one of the reasons that they were having so many issues was people were sick and tired of these extremely complicated vacations that they had to deal with travel agents for hours upon hours upon hours before they got it right. They were so tired at the end of dealing with travel agents that it's fun to uh, do a second vacation. It was so bad. So what did they do? They built a set of online tools on the destination site. And what the tools did? Basically, you went online. You chose the packages you wanted. If the pri you, you saved it if you didn't want to finish. You came back. If thing the prices had changed, you were notified. If there were recommendations that would enhance it, you were notified. And then you finally completed it at your own pace. Of all the things I just described, you know what the most important thing was? The save button. The save button gave you control over the choice, right? Because you could go to it or leave it at your leisure. And that was critical. Next year, literally within a year, again, Disney attributed at least in part to those changes, up it went, right? Revenues went back up. Meaning you're starting to see things when it comes to the idea of making sure the customers can control their own conversations with you. That's where the tools really come in. That's why you have systems of engagement now, right? As a, and in addition to systems of record. On the consumable and experiences side, that's one place you can actually create experiences and enable it with technology. A good example, look at American Girl. How many people have brought their children to American Girl stores? So what happens when you go there? Take your child there, she's already got a doll, this doll costs you 150 bucks. It's got a backstory, could be a history. There are accessories like there's a shaker doll, shaker beds, shaker clothes, shaker this, shaker that, lots of stuff that you can buy. That costs you another two, 300, uh, maybe more, depending on what you buy. Then you go to the store. And when you go to the store with the doll, what happens? You, um, you can get a haircut with your doll. Your daughter can get a haircut with her doll. You can eat lunch with her doll and watch a play with her doll about another doll. Now here's the deal. The doll has absolutely no idea that they got a haircut, ate food, or watched a play. It costs you $400 to do this. And yet your daughter is smiling and happy, and you're going to do it again, and again, and again, with this oblivious doll having her hair cut, her food in her tummy that doesn't digest anything, and watching a play with soulless eyes, but your daughter was happy, and that's what actually mattered. That's a consumable experience. This is the technology. I'm not going to dwell on this for a minute. I, what you do need to know, however, this is a bi-directional communications at all levels where data can be captured and data can be brought into systems of record as they're evolving into more active uh, systems of record in history, but that's, again, a whole other discussion. But these are now becoming de rigueur. They're becoming necessary for actually understanding the engagement on when you're scaling up with your customer. But here's where we get down to nitty gritty now, because we're going to look at the first steps to what you've got to actually do. Now, you might think, if you follow all the dicta of um, historic uh, customer-facing uh, lore, 
that you have to delight the customer all the time. You know what crap that actually is as a statement? First of all, you can't. It's literally impossible. The whole, by definition, you can't, and by action, you can't. I'll prove what I mean. First, we go to the definition. Delighting a customer literally means doing something so exceptional that they feel that it's exceptional, that they're loved, and that they don't expect it again after it happened. But if you're delighting them all the time, they do expect it again. And if they expect it again, it's not delightful anymore. It's what they expect. And then you have to up your game. And guess what? That costs you a lot more. And you keep going up, up, up. And this is, you look at history. You'll see it. Delight's good for occasion. You know what you got to do? Because you'll fail more often than not if you don't. Look in the dead center over there. Keep the ordinary ordinary. We know what that means. It's very simple. You've got a remarkable group of customers that you deal with every day. And most of them come to you for a reason, whatever the reason may be. They want to buy something from you. They need a service from you. Uh, they have five products they want from you. Or to Ray's point, they'll do end-to-end -end things that you provide. Or you'll do end-to-end -end things for them that you provide. The thing you can do which is most important for them is make their experience with you convenient and don't mess up on the ordinary. And that's easy enough to do. 90% of what's ordinary, you can literally automate. The other 10% you have to do manually, but 90% you can automate. Like, for example, I send an email out that says, please text me your address. There's two things I'm expecting out of that. Your address, and then it comes via text even though I emailed you. If you hit reply to my email and send it to me that way, you didn't ask, do what I asked you. That's a problem. You've got to do it the way I asked you in addition to what I asked you. The ultimate thing is make it convenient for that customer. How many of you don't like when things are convenient? You say, oh, well, that's easy enough. Or how many of you, when you go do your own work or your own businesses, are saying, well, if I do it that way, it'll take me five minutes. Or if I do it that way, it's going to take me an hour. I don't really gain that much from the hour. You're going to do the easy one, right? The five minutes. Because it's five minutes. I mean, the idea is we all are looking for things to be convenient, especially when it comes to our interactions with businesses. They don't have to be exceptional. They don't have to be super exciting all the time. That's on occasion, right? You do that, to, then customers really are delighted about it. Here's a perfect example. This is years ago. I was speaking at the Japan Society, and I was put up at the Hudson Hotel in New York. Super chic hotel, Philippe Stark building, you know, Minimalist the bar was like the hottest bar in New York City. Every drink was 30 bucks, right? I mean, it was like all white, icy looking thing. Because this was during the recession, there was a style that became popular they called retro European. So like the hotel, which is in the heart of New York City, called the elevators lifts, things like that. The ceilings were high, everything was dark, right? And you thought, oh, cool, and you go to the bar, super cool. Well, here's the deal. That's the lobby, that's the room. I don't, you can't really see the whole thing here, but over here, here's the bed, end of the bed, right next to it is the wall. Meaning, if I'm laying on the bed and I turn right, I bang my nose on the wall. If I turn left, I'll bang my nose on the wall. If I want to drop a penny, there's no room, right, to drop a penny between the wall and the bed. Then in the front of the bed, which you also can't see, over here, over there, just off that TV there. And the, notice where the TV is, by the way, hospital level, right? Uh, if you look at the desk, there's no chair. You have to sit at the edge of the bed. Worst, you see that curtain? It's translucent. You know where it leads to? The bathroom. There's no wall. There's no wall. Luckily, I'm alone, but you could literally look through there and see what's going on in the bathroom. This is the Hudson Hotel. Now, I wrote the big blog post on this called the margin of utility. That's what I call it. Meaning, there are certain things you expect out of a hotel, like the ability to work and sleep, right? This didn't meet any of them. As cool as the hotel was, as prominent an architect who built the building, as hot as the bar is, this doesn't even meet the minimum standard for my expectation of any hotel in the entire world, including a flea bag, right? And the point is that that, remember what I said about Bruce Temkin, you want a customer engagement that seriously says, 
okay, I'm going to keep coming back. I want to continue to interact with these guys. I really like them. I'm going to join their loyalty program. I'm be a... This hotel didn't even meet a minimum standard of utilit utilitarian business. And that's what I'm saying. You, you have to meet that before you do anything else. Meet that standard. Here's why. When the ordinary fails, the impact's greater on the experience than when the extraordinary and luxurious fails because there's no expectation of possible failure of the ordinary. None of us ever expect an ordinary action to fail. And if it does, it can be catastrophic. Here's a perfect example in an ordinary single place. I live in Manassas, Virginia. This, this isn't the actual UPS store, but it, there is a UPS store in Virginia, in Manassas, Virginia. There's about five or six of them. I go to this one. Why? I walk in, I go, hand him my package. He says, I'll take care of it. I leave. And that's done. He gives me a receipt in two seconds, I'm out. Simple as that. Everything is frictionless, everything is simple, everything is done quickly, and they are fully conscious that the outcome you are looking for as a customer is to be in and out of there as quickly as possible. I'm not there to hang out, I'm not there to engage at some long-term relationship, I'm there to get in and get out. In my new book, I wrote the guy in, because he deserves it, because he knows how to manage that store. He has everything organized so that that store is the most effective UPS store I've ever seen, because it does exactly what a customer wants from it. Get them in, get them out. Provide them with what they need to do that. And that is exactly what I'm talking about when I say keep the ordinary ordinary. That's optimal engagement right there. As simple as that is. And every small business in the world, every large business in the world can learn from exactly what he does. He only has another, it was him and one other employee. But they make sure the lines are moving if they're aligned. He does all the things you want. That's what I'm talking about on any scale. So how do you actually create the culture now? So here's the thing. The first thing you're doing when you're looking at how to create a customer-engaged culture, not a customer-centric culture, and we'll get into the difference in a minute, is understand that what a business values and what a customer values are two different things. Business values all those things on the left that you expect a business to value, which is profitability, revenue increases, customer satisfaction that leads to revenue via loyalty program, shareholder or stakeholder value increases, etc. Customers only value one thing ultimately, which is feeling valued. And how that manifests can be a million different ways. But they want to feel valued by you, and that's enough. As I said, when a customer likes you and continues to like you, they'll continue to do business with you. When they don't, they won't. If they feel valued, they will continue to do business with you. When I say why customer engaged rather than customer central, they're now going to look at what I mean by when I make that differentiation, because it really is a difference. And it's not bad to be customer centric, don't get me wrong, but it's not enough to really optimize what you're doing. So I'm going to start by talking about customer-centric by a story. So back in 2013, Ryanair had uh, two profit warnings, and their board of directors went bananas. They just went berserk. And they said, fix that problem right away. So Ryanair said, all right, what do we do? They created a program called Always Getting Better. Now, I want you to read what it actually says there. It says, booking a flight goes from 17 to 5 clicks. OK. But look at the next three. 24-hour grace period for canceling the flight without penalty. We expect that of every airline we deal with. They didn't have it. You cancel one minute after you do it, you pay. That's how they used to do it. Baggage fee cuts. They used to not even allow a second bag on board. That's the third one. They finally had a free second bag. in the. These are like big deals for Ryanair. And then finally, allowing portable electronic devices. They didn't even allow them on the plane. I mean, this was basically, you know, they, they were, you pay for everything, but we're cheap. And that's with their model, and it worked. They're the largest airline in Europe right now. But here's the deal. They implement this program, it turns around. That, highly customer-centric, it was, even though we expected, their customers didn't, highly customer-centric. But here's the kicker, and this is where the difference is. Michael O'Leary, who's the CEO of Ryanair, actually made this statement right after if I'd only known being nice to customers was going to work this so well, I'd have started many years ago. He actually said that. I mean, that's like, and you realize like how astonishing that statement is for a CEO of a major company to make, say it out loud? I'm thinking it's one of those things where he's thinking it to himself and didn't realize he said it out loud, because there's no other way somebody would be that dumb as to actually say that. But he said it. And the irony is he meant it, right? So. Here's the thing, though. So I want you to imagine this. Remember the reason it started. Profit dip, board of directors goes berserk. 
if the board of directors said, okay, enough is enough, that's starting to cost us too much, what would happen to that program? Go away, right? That's customer-centric, meaning tactically effective, and it was, and it's good. It still was a good program, and you know, it could be long-term. It doesn't mean it does go away. It could be long-term, but what's not happening is it's not in the DNA of the company to actually make sure that mutual value is realized at all times. And that's where the difference comes in. So now I'm going to give you another example. Over here, right underneath Michael O'Leary's statement is a statement from the chief customer officer of, Sandra, uh, of Dialog Oxiata, which is the largest telco in Sri Lanka. It's about 8 million customers, um, bond ratings off the charts, award winning on everything. Uh, she is brilliant. I've known her about a decade, I think. Um, this is what she said when she's talking about Dialog Oxiata and the services they provide and the experiences. This has more to do with bonding and relationships for the long term. It's not just the phone. It's not just revenue to us. Wherever you go, there's dialogue in your life making it easy for you. It's all about how well dialogue fits into Sri Lankan's lifestyles. This is service from the heart. And that's, you could say, okay, great marketing statement, but that's literally the way the company operates. So I'll give you an example. They spend a ton of time monitoring how customers engage with them every day, all channels. They do experience mapping. They do uh, a journey mapping, they do the whole thing every day, literally. They journey map every day, which is unbelievable. They're monitoring orchestration in real time. But here's the interesting thing. So once they got, they, they once did a very deep dive into their, uh, their customer base and they found, for varying reasons, they had a very large amount of pregnant women on their, in their customer base. Now they, they, they said, all right, well, you know what? Let's ask them what they need. So they went and focused in on the, uh, the pregnant women and the pregnant women said, look, we need a way to get questions answered about our pregnancy that doesn't require a visit to the doctor. And, you know, because when it boils down to it, one, it's hard to visit the doctor, they're pregnant, and two, the roads aren't great either. So it's hard to travel the roads in Sri Lanka. So these guys actually created a short code service, meaning, you know, you text the code, it comes back with something, and then you get charged a small fee. Uh, they created a short code service that would essentially put in the code, will come back as a, a doctor with name, schedule, you fill out what time you want to talk to him, the doctor would call you and answer all your questions. Then they, they had a whole team, uh, more than a team, they had a, a, a large group of effectively contracted doctors who were always available in the times they said they would to answer those questions. And what are, they, what are they saying right there? It's all about how well dialogue fits into Sri Lankan's lifestyles. That's what they're looking at. They're looking at how do they benefit the people that they serve. And how do they, of course, their business, how do they monetize their business while doing it? I mean, that's part of what they're looking at. And they're altruists on the one hand, but they're also a pretty successful business. So you're seeing that's, where, that's customer engaged, meaning it's deeply embedded in your roots that at all times you're focused on mutual value for you and your customers. Now, here's another example of how it begins to look at. I call, if you're actually achieving the kind of optimal culture and the customer is responding to you in an appropriate way, you become a, what I call a, a company like me. Back in 2000, Edelman uh, Group came out with a thing called the Edelman Trust Barometer. And the idea of the Edelman Trust Barometer is who your most trusted source was. And first few years of the Edelman Trust, it was the obvious and ironic one, it was like industry analyst, which you know made me feel sort of good, but uh, and at the same time, financial analyst, which made me laugh, right? So, uh, what happened though was 2003, 2004, a new um, a new category showed up. It was called a person like me. It meant someone who you felt had the same interests as you in some way, so that you trusted what they were saying, and that was 23 percent. Now, in 2019. Someone like me, a person like me, is 80, 82%. Is the, they are the single most trusted source of, of any kind of interaction with other, other institutions or individuals. Now, the interesting thing about that is that that person like me, who you trust, because you read a review site and you're looking for specifics about best something or another, you're not sitting there worried about the pedigree of the individual you're reading. You're automatically trusting them, actually, because they're also interested in what you're interested in. Like, you're looking at a restaurant review site, and the only thing you're saying, yeah, I like this, I like this, I like this, and then the email address of the 
thing, which is the only one you know, it's like rabiddog at gmail.com, but you're still trusting them, even though you're thinking, wow, whoa, maybe they are a rabid dog, you know, but you still, you trust them because they have similar interests. Well, the best possible scenario, again, I use this as a metaphorical term, obvious, it's very hard to actually achieve that, is that the customer has to feel that the company has their best interests at heart, and at the same time, are similar to them in makeup and like, and let's say, and, and in the way that they each want to interact with each other. The Chicago Fire, which is a soccer club in the MLS, actually had that kind of epiphany a few years ago. They used to be disastrous. So it's like the stadiums were 60% empty. And they used these generic messaging because, you know, their marketing was based on nothing really other than being cute, as opposed to based on what the customer is really looking for, what kind of outcomes they want, what, how the customer feels about them, etc. So their, their, out, their thing was Chicago on fire. Isn't that clever when they named the Chicago fire, right? Okay. So what they did is they, there's this group of highly passionate fans that's called Section 8. And they dug deeply into this, literally the psyches of Section 8. And they talked to all of them. They did a lot of work with them to figure it out. And then they hired a, a IDEO to come up with a storyboard. And they essentially said, all right, what is it we, we want to see? And they found the following. These are unpolished people, meaning they're just raw, blue-collar people who love the team. And if you actually go to Section 8 site and look at the, they have songs about how the Chicago Fire, like supporting Chicago Fire is like being high on hashish and LSD. I mean, they're literally at that level of whatever they say they say. I mean, they're, they're really wild, but they're pretty cool. Uh, and then they're proud to be fans. They're believable, meaning they don't bullshit. They just tell you what's what. They're irreverent. They're gritty. They're open people. So they began reorganizing everything to that and began bringing the fans in to work with them and to do a lot of effort. And they started building this story around Team Like Me. They have a song called Don't Stop Living in the Red. And you just have to listen to it and you'll understand what I'm saying. I'm not going to play it for you. But, and then the, their slogan is, where's your soul at? Right? I mean, they're like really down to it. And the fans' response was enormous to their campaign. In the first year, they had a 21 increase in attendance, year one, right, of this campaign. It really was effective. And look here, this is me, that's a company like me. So this, that's not actually me, as you probably can guess. Uh, but everything underneath there is me. New Yorker, Foodie, Yankees, Saturday Night Live, Tech Early Adopter, Irish Whiskey, Cats, Blues, Rock, right? That's me. But this is what a company like me has to do. They have to be personable. They have to be trustworthy. They have to be human. They have to, do, they have to actually do personalization with two different things. The DNA, they have to have the customer in the DNA. They have to be believable. They have to be empathetic. They have to be respectful. And they have to uh, essentially make the customer feel like they have peers at the company. So now we're going to dig in for the last uh, four minutes of this to discuss what it takes. First thing I want to make clear is, you know, we throw around the industry a lot of buzzwords, and we really do throw it around. And one of the big, or two of the big ones are transparency and authenticity. They're buzzwords, okay? I mean, there's nothing wrong with them. They're, they're appropriate. But you see that sentence by me? Just read it, and that's literally the way it actually is meant. That's me. Just read it. It's not, it's, this is, let's say, I've seen a lot of CEOs who are, Let's say their history was in, in high-powered sales who are the most inauthentic people I've ever heard talking about authenticity, right? And it just it doesn't work that way. There's much more to it. First one is always trustworthy, that you're trustworthy. But there's a lot to that. It's not just a simple matter. They trust that whatever you're saying they're getting, they're getting, right? That's a big deal because it doesn't happen always. They trust that you're truthful on your promise, on delivery, on your brand promise in any way it takes form, right? In this case, UPS and FedEx have 99% time, timely delivery. They expect it's 99%. Um, I had a time where GE kept promising me they were going to send me parts three times, right? Three to five days, didn't get any of the parts ever, right? I ended up having to buy them on an off, brand, on like a black site, I think, probably on the dark web, right? So. I mean, it's just they never, that's breaking a brand promise. The trust, the customer trusts that you'll tell them the truth when you need to, as, even if it's painful. Remember United's fiasco about 
I mean, Ray and I are both Global Services United players, so we obviously have a lot of uh, invested in that company. Remember when they threw that guy off the plane? Legally, they had the right to. However, they completely messed up everything about that. And they waited 24 hours before they even came out with a fake mea culpa. And they wrecked themselves just for that alone, just by the way they handle it. The truth is painful because they screwed up, but, and they didn't admit it until they had a very polished statement, and that didn't work. The idea is you talk when you need to talk, too little, too late. And the other one, and this is a big one, that you act as a trusted advisor to your customer. Look, you guys are small businesses, you're providing services. You remember what Ray was talking about with sort of the extension of that kind of service offering to a wider base. That's an ecosystem. Right, you're talking about your customers' ecosystems. They each have them, right? And if you did a survey of all your customers, end to end, and saw what they needed end to end, you'd know what you needed to do, right? And then you say, okay, well, we provide this, we provide this, we provide this, we need a partner to provide this, we need a partner to provide this, we'll do this later. And then you make that offering to them. That's what it means, that you're willing to say, okay, you know what, part of what they need is just some good advice on how to do stuff. Zoho is really good at that. One of Zoho's greatest strengths is their trusted advisors to their customer, and they're always available and always, uh, always available on your demand. That's one of the strengths they have. The Philadelphia Flyers are like that. Every single employee of the company is empowered to take any issue any customer has and go take care of it regardless of when or where. And they have, they're fully empowered to do it, and they have solutions for it. And that's why they're, when they rate them just coming into stadiums, right, where the, a lot of people have issues and they're they walk off with them to help them. They're, they're rated one to five, 97% of five, because of that. That's trust. Empathy. Now, this is, there's an actual business in the UK called the, or actual organization in the UK called the Empathy Business. We define corporate empathy, not compassion or sympathy, as the emotional impact the company has on its people, staff and customers, and society and the next generation. It's an average definition, but it's not wrong. This is what it involves. These are the things you have to take into account when you're looking at being an empathetic company. It means you're paying attention to the concerns of the planet, the concerns of the people, and the concerns of your employees, and the concerns of business as a whole. And all of these matter. There's an actual thing that says, all right, if you're going to do them, pay attention. Listen to The big one is always the same. Always, no matter how many years you know it, it's the same. You listen to your customers and you act accordingly. And you actually listen, you don't just hear them. You listen to them and you act on what they say. But you also give them on the options they need to interact with your company and make sure that you're accountable to them at all times. And the results, huge. This is Sandvik, right? Sandvik makes their code of conduct publicly available. They become part of what's called the Financial Times Sustainability uh, for Good Index. And take a look at this. They're public disclosure of over 300 items, including all of these, all of that, public disclosure of a $10 billion enterprise. And then every year, they nine years running, they've been considered one of the most sustainable companies on the planet, one of the most trustworthy companies on the planet, and are a $10.5 billion company that's continuously profitable because of their willingness to be accountable, empathetic, and supportive of what people do. The other one is just be human. And not... When I say that, I don't mean personalization. That's optimized offers based on what you know about a customer given the data you have. This is human. And I'll give you a very specific example. Speaking of the Yankees, my wife and I every year go to New York on a vacation. And like Ray, I have a million Marriott points, you know, so we use them for the vacations. And we went, uh, we just a weekend, and we always go to a Yankee game, always go to Broadway. And we went, we stayed at the Ritz Carlton on Central Park South because there's so many damn points. And when, the, when I went there, they said, so what are you going to be doing in New York? And they said, we're going to see play this, uh, see this play, this play, we're going to go to the Yankee game. The morning I was going to the Yankee game, literally this appeared in my room. I don't know how well you can see it. This is a tray of cookies. These are gluten-free macaroons. And the interesting thing is, my wife was, is gluten-free. The only person we ever even mentioned that to was not on our profile, was to the manager of the restaurant, but somehow that got included. And this, the Yankee symbol, is made out of white and dark and milk chocolate. And they dropped it in our room, and it says here, have a great time at the Yankee game. 
And then we got a call from the manager saying, we really want you to have a good time. Uh, please enjoy this. Uh, at a, we, we really appreciate your business. And then she said, I'd like to hear about the game when you come back. That's a human touch. It's not personalization. I mean, it involves what they know of us, but it's a human touch. And it makes a huge difference in how you respond. Again, I speak on lots of stages. I've used this example countless times. That's what I'm talking about. Be personable. Be human. Work with them. These are small touches. You can do them at your business all the time. You probably do, but you've got to systematize it. And finally, respectful. And what that means is very simple. It's not just respectful, oh, we respect you. It's respectful of their privacy. It's respectful of their choices. It's respectful of how they want to participate in an initiative with your company. So for example, if you use opt out as your standard, I don't like you. I literally automatically don't like you. Why? Because you're basically telling the customer, we're going to hit you with this until you opt in on everything. That's a big difference in how one thinks. Because ultimately, the customer has to have the choice of whether they want to spend money on you or not. You can't have them constantly. Auto renewal, another one. right? The customer needs to have the choice. It doesn't mean you need to not have it. It means the customer needs to be able to make the choice. That's how you respect them. Let them make the choices of how they want to communicate with you, interact with you, transact with you. That's the key. Finally, we're going to go into a case study, and then I'm letting it go. I'm an Irish whiskey guy. That's my thing. Told. This is literally the Irish whiskey I own of this one company, literally sitting in my bar at home. I literally pulled all the bottles out just to take this picture for this, because I think that highly of this company. This is Teeling Whiskey. It's the, in Dublin, it's the first new uh, distillery in 125 years. Now, if you look at Irish whiskey the way it's generally known, you have um, Jameson, right? And Jameson is history. 1780, you go to their tour, it's all about the history, you see all the historic buildings, historic distillery methods, the whole thing. And they spend the entire tour about history. 1780 on. This, on the other hand, is Teeling. New age of Irish whiskey. That's how they approach it. And that's the impression, the engagement they want from the customers. Those people who understand new, the new way, the Irish whiskey, the new world, the world we live in. So you go to the Teeling's distillery, and what do you see, right? This is the history. You, they literally take you in. You literally are put in a room for 10 minutes to look at panels with Irish whiskey history, and that's it for history. Then you're taken right into the distillery where you start seeing these things. Now, if you'll know, these are contemporary pot stills. You see that sort of long uh, oval thing? That's actually so you can look inside all their equipment, every piece of equipment. It allows you to see how the process is done. They have 22 languages that they cover this in. And this, again, this is not a Jameson monster. It's a smaller place, but it's not small. This is the tasting room. It's set up deliberately to be kind of exquisite and luxurious, but still contemporary in look. This is really what it looks like hipster hangout for Dublin. A lot of people, they're in a Tony kind of hipster neighborhood. You know, they're doing all that kind of new market, I think. Um, this is the bottling. Look at the bottle, the style of the bottling. Everything is based on we are the new age of Irish whiskey and that you engage with us that way. Look at this. Year one of the distillery's opening, 150,000 visitors, which is 10 times more than a typical Irish whiskey distillery. 116 global awards through 2018. They, they highly experimental success in markets like whiskey made with Akavit casts in Sweden. I mean, really willing to go to that because they understand the customers they're dealing with. They have the data on what they do, how they think, how they live, how they grow. 37% revenue growth within 2016 to 2017. Last year, it was 62%. Meaning you're talking about significant growth because they're focused on engaging customers and they understand them exceptionally well. So, in sum, if you take this as a whole, we're looking at something, we're really in a new world. I mean, you know, we're in a world, though, that we can all accomplish something. Because remember what I said on the cultural aspect? The big one for you guys, just think of the humanization side of your small business. It's not like you have to do big things and spend tons of money. You simply have to provide those little touches that your customers are looking for you to provide, but you don't have to do that every day. Just make sure the business works right and they get what they need from it. But what I would highly recommend to Ray's point, 
is that you're looking for outcomes all the time. You're understanding the outcomes your customers want so you can engage them more appropriately, and that leads eventually to the transactions that make your business more successful. So with that, thank you very much.